in the last six years, many of the assumptions with regards to political economy, with regards to social policy, public policy, with regards to how politics deals with people's everyday problems have been smashed. The political economy of neoliberalism, broadly ascendant since the mid-1970s, no longer has the consensus that it once did. People's living standards across the board in the United Kingdom are in decline. What have the last six years meant for the Green Party? Well, I think, first of all, if you look at the Green Party over the past six years, the big event for us was, of course, the election of Caroline Lucas as our first MP in 2010. You know, that made us a parliamentary party. It gave us the opportunity to put bills before Parliament. I mean, Caroline at the moment has one that would bring the railways back into public hand. It's given us more profile, more opportunity to do things. So that's a huge aspect of the past six years. Uh, we've also seen the, the membership of the Green Party double in that time, which is, of course, quite exciting. If you look at the, the, the broader framework of these things, the, the state of politics, I think we've seen, you can divide it into two periods, 2007 to 2010, people were obviously shocked by the economic crisis, by the banking crash, but they were also, there was a feeling in that period that, oh well, we always knew that the end of boom and bust was a fiction really, uh, and, but this is just one of those crises of capitalism that we know happen and things will move on much as they were before. Mm. But I think we're at the point now, sort of gradually developing over the past three years, is a real sense that, no, we're at a real turning point. Neoliberalism, privatisation, globalisation has actually hit, really hit the buffers. This is a system, a way of thinking about the world, a way of acting that is run out of steam, that is, is now actively dangerous and we have to change. What's really lacking at the moment, I think, is a sense of of how, um, what the new world, what the new possibilities look like. What does a prosperous future in which our, our children and grandchildren, the coming generations, have a better life than we have? At the moment, we need to do a huge amount of work of painting that picture. Why do you think UKIP have benefited so much from a crisis where many of the uh, solutions they propose are broadly an extension of an ideology that's been discredited? Well, I think if, if, if this has been some very good demographic work on the people who vote UKIP, and they're very much you know, people from uh, from lower incomes, lower education levels, older people who feel like the world has changed and they don't really don't understand where things are. And you know, UKIP paints a picture of going back to some, but you know, past golden age, non-existent golden age. Then somehow or other, you know, doing a couple of magic things like stopping immigration and leave, leaving the EU will magically transform. And that's an attractive vision to some people. I think, however, we, you know, it's a little early to tell. But I think we're actually seeing a point. I mean, you know, despite the fact that UKIP finished second in a couple of uh, parliamentary by-elections, it's also become very clear that it's going to be extraordinarily hard for them to win a seat. Uh, in 2015. Uh, they may or may not do as well in the uh, European elections. It's interesting because actually the polls have come off in the past few months um, and you know, UKIP has been exposed a little bit like, I, I wouldn't necessarily compare them politically, but if you look at what happened to the BNP when they had the light of day shone on them, the light of publicity shone on them, they fell apart quite quickly. And you know, UKIP have had a lot of scandals, a lot of things that have made, made people who might have voted UKIP sort of lean back and go, oh, perhaps not. So I think you know, it, it's actually very hard to see where UKIP goes. You know, with the current electoral system, uh, UKIP has some pretty serious barriers there and they also have some pretty serious institutional structures. And they also, you know, simply don't present a very coherent picture of what they'd actually like to do. I mean, you know, uh, Mr Farage has apparently declared his entire 2010 manifesto as nonsense. And that kind of thing, you know, doesn't play very well in the longer term, I don't think. <laughs> so what makes the Green Party different? Because you're saying that first past the post doesn't suit uh, newcomers, it favours incumbents, it means there's high cost of entry if you want to enter Westminster. The same applies to the Green Party, no? Well, no, because we've actually, we've shown that when we have overcome that. I mean, the, the Green Party's been around for 40 years. It's taken us a long time, you know, to build up to get that first Westminster seat. But we showed the discipline, the organisation, and, you know, we had the track record in Brighton and Hove as having had a large number of councillors there for some time. So we actually have done the build up, have done the hard work, where a party that has very strong democratic structures, our policies are made by our members. You know, it's not, uh, it's not a case of, you know, the, the leader suddenly deciding that, I'm going to write off all of our old policies and have a new lot. We have a whole democratically developed policy system. We have councillors up and down the country who are you know, really solid people delivering good work on the ground. Uh, you know, in Norwich, uh, for example, we've been the opposition on the council there for quite some time. And so, you know, in Solihull, we're likely to be in that position. We've been building up gradually, doing the hard work on the ground, being the people who are there for local communities. So we have that track record, uh, and that makes us very different to UKIP.
If you look at the lay of the land politically in the run-up to the 2015 general election, it increasingly seems as if it's going to be uh, characterised by a cost-of-living crisis, discussions about a cost-of-living crisis. That's even the case, it seems, within the Conservative Party. You've got a number of backbenchers trying to influence uh, the Chancellor with regards to increasing the minimum wage to what it would have been had it uh, maintained parity with inflation over the last several years. Within that narrative of a cost-of-living crisis, where does the Green Party fit? Because it seems to me that, for some, discussing a cost-of-living crisis with regards to a first-world country is at odds with a sustainable idea of a future economy. So if you're talking about a cost-of-living crisis, how the poor, for instance, can ensure that they have sufficient heating, if you can uh, talk about increasing aggregate demand or consumption for low-income earners, that doesn't necessarily reside particularly well with green econ economics. Oh, I wouldn't agree with that at all. I mean, a f foundation of green economics is that social and environmental justice go together. Uh, and you know, what I say is what we're trying to achieve is a situation where everyone's society has the access to the resources for a decent quality of life. And if you take, for example, one Green Party policy that's been there ever, ever since the start, which is basic income or citizen's income, which is you know, a very foundational idea relating to that. Uh, but I think, you know, I think cost of living crisis is, is a very narrow way of looking at our current problems. Um, you know, we have a whole system that isn't working, that isn't delivering for people anymore. And if we think, for example, you know, the, one of the obvious ones is energy bills. Now we've got various, you know, other parties making promises on, you know, cutting so-called green levies, which means they're actually cutting the rate of houses are being insulated for the Tory party. Uh, you've got Labour who are saying, you know, we're going to have this price freeze for a fixed period of time. But what we say is, first of all, what we have to do is look at energy consumption. We need warm, comfortable homes that are affordable to heat. And that means an entire change in the, in the quality of our housing. And so we back through the, the program that's called the Energy Bill Revolution, which suggests the idea of taking the money from carbon taxes that the government gets and putting it into energy efficiency, insulation and other things in every home that needs it. Now, that policy would lift nine out of ten people out of fuel poverty, create up to 200,000 jobs and cut carbon emissions. So that's just one example of the kind of ways in which we actually need, need to change things. If you look at the broader economy, then you're actually you're thinking about, we talk about the need to relocalise our economy, bring manufacturing and food production back to Britain, bring all of those jobs and economic opportunities and business opportunities back to Britain, and rebuild strong local economies. So you know, if you build it around local businesses, small businesses and cooperatives, then money goes round and round in a town, creating jobs, creating opportunities. Whereas if you know, we have the big globalised multinational structure, money just swooshes away out of town. So is globalisation a force for good? Because it doesn't sound like you think it is. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, I'm not talking about autarky or anything like that. I quite like my morning coffee uh, and I don't mind the odd banana. But, you know, what we need to do is, is the basics of life, our basic staple foods, uh, our clothing, the table, all of those kind of things. We need to make those sort of things much more locally. Uh, and globalisation, you know, has just been utterly the wrong direction. It hasn't worked for, um, you know, for the developed world. But also we're increasingly recognising the kind of damage that's been done in the developing world. I remember uh, watching pictures of every major party political leader and Nigel Farage all in there. Well, Nick Clegg was kind of, you know, unique in so much as he wore jeans. But everybody else was wearing, you know, sort of like barber overalls and their wellies and so on. Probably never seen the outside of a Land Rover in Chelsea and now they're being put to good use. Um, but I thought, you know, why isn't Will Duckworth, Natalie Bennett, Caroline Lucas, why aren't they in Somerset with their wellies and their overalls? Because, like, people, it's a very hackneyed comment. But it's so true. Never let a crisis go to waste. And I thought it almost strange that the Green Party was notably absent from that conversation. Do you think th those floods, that crisis of the winter, um, present a real opportunity for the Green Party to make strong public arguments about climate change and effects, real concrete, tangible effects it's going to have here in the UK? Well, I think, first of all, I'll address the wellies question. Yeah. Um, what I chose to do instead was I, I launched our 10-point flood response plan uh, from the Thames Barrier, 
because it's a, an example of, of where we've made some very effective measures to deal with flooding that involves significant public investment and really looking to the long term. So rather than you know join, joining the, 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 well, the Wellington chud, trudge, you might call it, uh, I thought I'd focus on something positive instead and not, you know, um, you know, lots of people, there was quite a lot of complaints about you know, politicians trailing around who are actually interfering yeah. with flood relief efforts. And, you know, that's just not the right thing to do, uh, very obviously. Um, but on the broader question of in terms of... Um, uh, of making sure you know, help you know, using this to really say, look, climate change is here; it's now a reality. You, know, the IPCC report came out last year, and any kind of scientific debate about the reality of climate change is over. You know, obviously, it's really driven this home to people. And there was a very telling YouGov poll that came out, and in, they ask it every week. They ask people what the three most important issues to them are. And environment jumped in one week from nine percent to twenty three percent. Now that's you know practically unprecedented, and, and certainly demonstrates that people really have caught on to the fact that climate change is really here now, visible. Your party's uh, committed to a guaranteed basic income. For some, that's an incredibly radical policy, and it's been Green Party policy for quite a while. It's gaining increased traction with regards to not just NGOs, but a lot of the mainstream media has been talking about it in the last several years. How radical a measure do you think it is? Because for some, it would mean the end of capitalism. I'm not quite sure. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily see it that, but it would certainly see a transformation of, of basically taking away the fear. I mean, we're at the moment, we've had an increasingly unequal society. We've gone past uh, 20s levels of inequality and we're now heading towards Victorian levels of inequality. The benefit safety net has been you know, ripped to shreds people are very frightened about this and the basic income just takes away the fear. And one of the interesting things about it is that um, you uh, people are always, uh, mainstream economists find it really hard to model and frightens them silly because it changes people, would change people's behaviour. And you know, it might be hard to find people to do really miserable jobs. Um, you might end up with a sewer cleaner being paid more than a banker and maybe that's fair and reasonable. Uh, but you know, it creates it creates the basis whereby people don't have to take utterly miserable, soul-destroying, uh, you know, horrible situations to it, it work employment just because that's there's no alternative. Uh, and you know, it's, it's very important and really makes potential change. And it's interesting that Switzerland is having a referendum on it. There's been a very big push for an EU. Uh, they didn't quite get the numbers, but an e EU um, citizen-initiated um, debate on it. And that's going to come back again. And so it's very much an idea that's growing. Across not just the European Union, but more broadly the world, we're seeing declining memberships for political parties. That's the case not just here in the United Kingdom for the Conservatives, where we're seeing a party with a membership plausibly of fewer than 100,000. It was 3 million in the 1950s. Same is true, of course, for Labour. To a lesser extent, there's a decline over the long term with regards to party membership there, and of course the Liberal Democrats more recently. However, you go to Germany, SPD, same story. The Partido Popular in Spain, same story. Passock in Greece, same story. So across the political spectrum and across countries, we're seeing a decline in memberships of party politics. Increasingly, it seems that people don't seem to situate political parties within their own practice in terms of better politics or seeking social justice. So how important is joining a party, or specifically the Green Party, for someone who broadly thinks they are aligned with your political project? Or can they just buy their ethical bananas and coffee? Well, I think it's it's important to acknowledge that you know political actions come in a wide range of formats. If you organise a, a, a litter pick in your local community to make your community better, that's a political action. Um, but ultimately, where the decisions are made is in your local council in Westminster, in Brussels. That's where the decisions are made. And what I think we've seen uh, you know, over the past decade or so is particularly NGOs have adopted a lobbying model. They've said, oh, well, you know, we, we can't get too close to the Green Party. We can't get too big P political because we've got to lobby our local Labour council and lobby the Tory government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but actually, I think very clearly that lobbying model has failed. I think you know, the, I only have to say one phrase, the greenest government ever, um, which is now a very sad, sick joke. And that was the product of, of lobbying the kind of people who were Tory and Lib Dem politicians and people saying, oh, we'll just lobby them because they're the people in power. 
But what we actually have to do is put people like us, people who think like us, in power. Because that's where the decisions are made, that's the only way things are going to get changed. Now, I regard the Green Party as, as, as the uh, political wing of what I call the small g green movement. And that means everything from UK Uncut and Occupy to Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, right through to the RSPB and the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England. You know, across that broad spectrum, we need to actually elect people with those views, with those ideas, with those backgrounds to be the people making the decisions. It's not good enough anymore for us to just be lobbying the political class.